All right, so today I want to introduce you to one of the most amazing advancements in ball python genetics that's definitely going to change the entire ball python industry as we know it. Scientists have figured out how to take the shed skin of a ball python, extract the DNA from that shed, and using that DNA, they can figure out what the genes are in your ball python, which is pretty amazing. As a matter of fact, I first heard about this about five or six years ago when people are kind of throwing it around just as an idea thinking about doing the project and when I first heard about it I kind of had my doubts as far as the feasibility if it would actually work so I decided all right it's been a few years I'm actually going to do a quick internet search and see if anyone's been working on it and to my surprise I found a university that's been working on it for quite a few years they've had over a hundred people work on this project and they made significant progress they've really nailed down several genes and they can identify them in the lab to see if they're in your snake and one of the ones that's a little bit tricky that they've actually nailed down is the albino gene. So keep in mind the albino is a recessive gene where you need two copies of the gene for a visual. And if you actually breed it to something else, you get one copy of the albino, but you won't see any markers on the snake. You can't tell that it's het for albino. If you actually take that het albino, you breed it to something else, you know, there's a 50% chance and then you start breeding it through your collection and it gets diluted further and further. And then after a while, you're kind of scratching your head. All right, which ones are het for albino and which ones aren't? And you know, some of them, it gets diluted so far down that, you know, potentially you could have some head albinos in your collection and not even know it. With this new technology, essentially what you can do is you can take the shed skin of your snake, send it into the laboratory, and with their tests, they can actually tell you with 100% certainty if your snake is or isn't head for albino. That is absolutely powerful. Another thing they've actually discovered with the albino is there's actually two versions of the albino. I actually want to take you over to the website, show you some of the amazing statements that they've actually made and try to interpret those, those statements. There's some stuff that, that's going on that nobody knew about in all of all pythons that's just kind of being uncovered with these genetic tests which is pretty amazing. So I want to bring you over to that website, kind of show you the ins and outs just real quick of what they found over there. I also wanted to show you what a shed looks like. If you haven't seen a ball python shed, essentially this is what it looks like. It's just the shed skin. Uh, this happens to be Bobby's shed. It's, it's almost a complete shed, one of his best sheds. I just kind of hung on to it. And uh, essentially what you do is you send this into the lab and they can tell you some of the genetics. So uh, I think they've nailed down maybe like six genes, something like that, five or six genes. Keep in mind in ball pythons, there's hundreds and hundreds of genes. So for example, like bamboo, this is actually a bamboo ball python. You actually couldn't send this in and do a test for bamboo with the current technology, but they're continually adding uh, all these different genes. And it was kind of smart to actually start with the recessive because everyone wants to know if their snake is is het or not for a certain recessive gene, which is really powerful. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump over the internet and I wanna show you some of the amazing results that they've discovered in this laboratory. All right, so I'm gonna jump over here on the internet. This is the website for the Eastern Michigan University where they're actually performing these experiments. And I want to show you this page first. This, these are actually the color morphs for which tests are available. So you can actually do tests for, it looks like they have uh, five right here that they've nailed down. And then it looks like they have a note down here that they're working on the pied, which pretty much is the number one thing I'm actually looking for is the, the head pieds. I have a whole bunch of head pieds through my collection. And let me tell you, if I could figure out one from the other, I would probably go through and thin out my collection. You know, I have a lot of stuff that I held back that's you know 50% head pied you know you can't you kind of flipping the coin on some of that stuff but if I knew 100% sure I might actually unload some of my holdbacks so I'm anxiously awaiting the genetic test for the pies but if you actually look at these they actually have a test for albino uh, for toffee and keep in mind the toffee and the albino are allelic so you can have one copy of albino, one copy of toffee, and you get a toffino, 
which is, if, you, if you're familiar with the toffees and the toffinos, the toffinos are kind of interesting because if you actually take the toffee, which kind of has this purplish background, you mix it with the albino, which has a white background, you end up with a toffino that's kind of halfway between a toffee and the albino. And it's kind of the same thing with the candy and the candinos. As a matter of fact, a lot of people consider the toffees and the candies to be the same thing or two different lines of similar genes. And then you have the lavender albino, which is completely different than the regular albino. As a matter of fact, you can actually take the lavender albino, breed it to an albino, and you'll get double hats. They'll look like normal ball pythons. They'll be het for albino and het for lavender, so they're not compatible. And then you have the ultra male, which uh, one of the most interesting things I would actually like to see in this is the, the comparison between the ultra male and the monarch. The ultra males and the monarchs look really similar. I'd say some, in some cases they look really close. And I'd say in most cases the monarchs have a little bit more color. It's a little bit uh, darker of more of a coffee color in the background, but I always thought maybe they could be compatible where if you actually took an ultra male, brought it to a monarch, it'd be interesting to see if they're actually allelic. Although I have heard rumors that people have actually taken the ultra male, bred it to a monarch, and they get the double hats where it's actually two different genes. The big difference between the ultra males and the monarchs, the monarchs are really super expensive and the ultra males are usually just a few hundred bucks for a hatchling. So there's a big difference in price between the ultra males and the monarchs. So take a look at this. They actually have some notes over here from some of the genetic testing they did. And this is really where it kind of blew my mind on some of this stuff. So take a look at this. Uh, they actually have a statement in here uh, with the toffee and the candy. The toffee and the candy morphs appear to be caused by the same allele. We hypothesized that this morph was discovered twice and named toffee by one person and candy by another person. So it's kind of interesting to actually look at the genetics where you can actually look at it in the lab and separate the two, see if they're completely different or the same. And based on this, I would say it looks like our suspicions are correct that the toffee and the candy is exactly the same. Although I would like to see more examples of the toffee versus candy. You know, sometimes you can actually have uh, some people saying toffee slash candy, and sometimes you can have uh, toffee sold as candies that can get really mixed up. So it'd be interesting to see kind of on more of a broader range of toffees and candies if this hypothesis that they're exactly the same is still consistent with all the toffees and the candies. That'd be kind of interesting. You know, the other thing that would be kind of interesting is if you could actually separate uh, the different versions of the azanthic. You know, it'd be interesting to see if you can actually get a double visual azanthic from two different lines of azanthic. Like, for example, you can actually have the VPI and the TSK. If you actually took those two azanthics and bred them together, you'd actually get normal looking snakes that are double, uh, double heads. So potentially you could go down that project if they actually uh, went down the azanthic path on this and then you could just figure out what all your hatchlings were, but just take the sheds and send them into the lab. And then you can easily figure out your VPIs from your TSKs and then you could see what a true double azanthic actually looks like, which would be the power of this whole thing, which is pretty amazing. So take a look at this. I thought this was interesting too. Ultramel versus Carmel Albino. So it seems like they've been doing some work with the Carmel Albino, even though they haven't listed it as one of the genes at the very beginning. So take a look at this. We discovered that the Ultramel color morph has two alleles. We hypothesized that one of these alleles may represent the morph originally described as Carmel Albino. Carmel Albino animals look similar to Ultramel's. We hypothesize that the two morphs are allelic. So that's kind of interesting. I've never thought about taking an ultra male, breeding it to a carbon albino, and see if you get uh, a double head that would actually be a visual. And it also says, it goes on to say, we suspect that some animals described as ultra males are actually caramel albinos, which is pretty interesting. 
that you can actually get the ultramels and caramel albinos confused. Uh, yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting that the further they go down this, and then the question is, is ultramel really different than the caramel albino since they are allelic? Which is kind of interesting there. And the, the, kind of the other thing with the uh, the ultramels versus caramel albinos, I say the caramel albinos kind of get uh, kind of a bad rap as far as, you know, having the genetic defect of kinking in a lot of your caramel albinos. Although I have heard some people say they've been breeding caramel albinos for 20 years and none of their animals have had the kinks in the spine like the genetic defects. I've actually seen some ultramels well, once in a while have a kink in the spine, but usually the ultramel name's not really associated uh, with uh, really bad kinking like you would uh, kind of see with the caramel albino name. So I think the, the caramel albino name has kind of fallen out of popularity and everyone's kind of going towards the ultramel. Wouldn't it be funny if the ultramels were actually caramel albinos? That would be interesting. All right, so I thought this was interesting too. Another page over here on this website, storing shed skins. So they go on to say, we have found that the DNA in shed skins is stable for months as long as the sheds are stored dry. So if you have any old sheds from a couple months ago, you may still be able to send them in. All right, so here's another page. Uh, how to contribute needed ball python sheds. So uh, they'll actually do, right now they'll actually do testing for free. If you send them their sh your shed, they can actually tell you, like for example, if you had like a 50% head albino and you wanted to know if it was het for albino, you could send it in for free, which is pretty awesome. So they tell you exactly what to do uh, as far as cleaning and drying and packing it, where to send it and everything. And then over here, you can actually do monetary donations. So if you actually just want to support financially. All right, so this is the last page I wanted to show you. These are the people that have worked on this project over here at the university. This project's actually headed up by Dr. Hannah Seidel. And they have all these people listed under here. They have some undergraduates. They have a total of 108 undergraduates. They have all these bio students right here listed in really tiny print <laughs> a whole bunch of names all over here of all the people that have worked on this this is pretty awesome and let me tell you i am definitely really excited about this and another really real world application of this i've actually seen some people they'll take two snakes breed them together and say for example one will have like six or seven genes and another one will have like seven genes they breed them together and they'll have all these hatchlings where they'll have like eight nine ten eleven genes in all their hatchlings and i've actually seen people breeding a lot of these multi-gene snakes together they get a whole bunch of hatchlings and they can't id any of the hatchlings because there's just so many genes and wouldn't it be awesome if we can get to the point where we had like 100 150 genes identified in the lab where you can actually take the shed skin of those hatchlings send it into the lab and know exactly all the genes that are in some of these multi-gene animals that would be really powerful all right, guys, thanks for coming along for the ride. I just kind of discovered this and thought I'd give you an update as far as some of the new advancements coming out in ball pythons. So thanks for coming along. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.